Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy. Hi folks and welcome to Through a Scottish Prism and on Christmas Eve too. I hope you and yours are all ready for the big day tomorrow. Things are going well for you. Um, I'm sad to say that our Phil's not trapped today, so we have to go without him. He may join us later, but don't worry, we have our stellar crew here for you. We have our favourite lawyer there in Clack Manonshire, our Eva. Hi, Love your hat. Love your hat. <laughs> I'm just looking in with Santa. Does he know that you've been good all year? Does he know? But what can I tell you? <laughs> I'm the best boy going. <laughs> um, not so much Mrs McLeod, but I'll come on to that. And down there in the borders with a real crack in a hat, it's really going. Yes, uh, my husband thinks I look like a leprechaun, but um, he's bar humbug and all that. So uh, He's a smooth talker, obviously, isn't he? Yes, uh, he's uh, obviously not bothered about his Christmas presents. And uh, uh, up there in Edinburgh, it's our very own weatherman, it's Art Lloyd, with his Christmas tree. We're doing great. Yes. Nice to see you. Yep. So we're not, we've not got full, but I'll just start. Just to say, I, the good news, folks, is I won't be speaking so much because I've got the dreaded lurgy here. I'm running a temperature. And I have to say that Mrs. McLeod was asked to book an ambulance and a, a bed in the, in the intensive care, but she didn't pay attention. Told me to man up and shut up, which I didn't think was very nice. So tomorrow I'll be going down to Mr. Wing Ping's Chinese Emporium and returning her potato peeler. No Christmas present for her. <laughs> she's, she's been a naughty girl. Anyway, yeah, if I suddenly pa pass out, or whatever, I'm absolutely roasting here. Anyway, enough of this nonsense. I just thought I'd get in a bit of light-hearted before we get started, because there's really not much to be light-hearted about, Eva. Last week, when we were talking that the, the Section 35 had been, the, the appeal had been upheld, we had hoped that Humza and his cabal would take this opportunity to ditch the most unpopular piece of legislation ever. But no, they're again going cap in hand, begging the Labour Party that when they come in, if they'll put it through. I, I, I just despair, Eva. I would say disappointing, but it's not surprising. The bill should be binned. It shouldn't be on the shelf. The vast majority of the population of this country know that, and actually so do most right-thinking people worldwide, because self-identification is just a dangerous concept. And mm -hmm. the rights of women and vulnerable people, particularly children, need to be protected, and they're jeopardised by self-ID. We've said this over and over again. You know, we're, we're all sick to the back teeth talking about Men in women's prisons, men in women's hospital wards, men in changing rooms, all this sort of stuff. Men in vehicle in their way in where they ought not to be. Because, quite frankly, everybody knows that a trans-identifying man is a man. Trans women are a subset of males. And if they have difficulty in, for example, male prisons or male toilets or male changing rooms, then that's a problem that should be addressed with men. It's not a problem that should become something that women have to worry about or try to solve or correct. But what's very upsetting about the line that the SNP have chosen to take is that they're doing this in part to maintain the Butte House Agreement, even although the Greens obviously said if it doesn't pass, then they'll bend that agreement. But they're obviously quite happy to hold on to their ministerial positions in the meantime, albeit that practically every single green, in inverted commas, flagship policy has either been binned or is hugely unpopular, very expensive and completely unsuccessful and generally not based on either reality or common sense. So, Did you, sorry, on you go, Peter. What's really plain is that the SNP are simply hedging their bets. They're hoping that somehow they can be some kind of kingmakers in Westminster come a general election, and they actually think that K 
Keir Starmer's going to look twice in their direction and, in effect, fling them a bone. Um, but, as we know, Keir Starmer's got form relative to gender recognition and self-ID too. So these are very dark days. And what we need to have is a clear distinction between gender and the maintenance of sex services and provisions generally. Set that in tablets of stone first and then look at what issues need to be considered from the perspective of trans people. We've heard practically every day this week that trans people have health-related issues that need to be considered. On the one hand, on the other, we've often been told that the state of being trans is not a health issue and it's not a mental health issue. So if that's the case, I really would like to know what are the health issues that require to be addressed. I hope it's not puberty blockers for teenagers and mutilating surgery for children in adolescence, because that is what we've seen elsewhere in the world and to an extent in the United Kingdom. I mean, there have been dozens of girls that have gone from Scotland down to England for surgery on the NHS, whereby they've had double mastectomies and worse. This sort of stuff needs to be spoken about openly and we need to be able to express our opinions, which are valid, without being called names and being really the target of some pretty offensive abuse. So I had hoped the bill would be binned, we could have a reset, we could get back to prioritising independence because this is the issue that has split the movement and we could talk sensibly about having a consultation where all relevant views are heard. We're nowhere near that because the SNP refuse to see sense. Yeah, absolutely. Yvonne, were you surprised when uh, they refused to bin it and top approached Keir Starmer? I was actually, um, like thousands of other women, I was just celebrating the end of um, of the Gender Recognition Reform Bill. And I, I just, when Shirley Ann Somerville said the SNP wouldn't be dropping it, despite the, the you know, this really humiliating court loss, I couldn't believe it. And it just, reminded me of um, when I was outside Holyrood with uh, loads of the women who won't wished and they were singing this song and the final line of the song is this isn't over yet and unfortunately it isn't over yet. I mean I was hoping uh, that we would have something really good to look forward to in 2024 but yet again we're going to have to have our um shoulders to the wheel on getting rid of this damn grr it's like a boomerang you know it, it's coming back again and um and of course now uh alistair jack is getting all antsy saying that um the the Scottish government is going to have to pay for all the legal money that wasted on propping up a bill that nobody wants. And it's this arrogance that the SNP and the Greens have. They're not reading the room. They seem to be totally blind to, to people's... Um, views on this and uh you know we there's um eddie izzard uh didn't get selected down in brighton um one of the most um enlightened uh or progressive areas in britain and if that isn't a wa warning sign of what the public wants and doesn't want, um, we're going to have to be on our guard at every turn because um, they've shelved it, they've mothballed it, which means that they'll bring it out as soon as they possibly can 
and uh, and how they'll do it. You know, there's all sorts of sneaky mechanisms that can do, but it's just all of the energy that they're spending on this when they could be using that energy to get us bloody independence, which is what the SNP was originally about. I mean, it's... Yeah. It, it's I, I just feel for all of those heroic women, um, the likes of Elaine Miller and all of them who just have really gone that extra mile to try and get rid of this GRR, and yet it's come back again. And um, it's obviously quite clear <coughs> that the Greens don't want to lose the Butte House Agreement so their red lines and uh, unshakable principles um, are obviously a lot more flexible than we were led to believe. And uh, they'll obviously, it's clear now that the Greens will do anything to keep in power. Yeah, I, um, I've got to pull you up. You used the word Greens and principles in the same sentence which, of course, is a no-no. They have no principles whatsoever. Um, Lloyd, I, the, more I see of, none, the more I see of uh, politicians, the more I realise that most of them are half-wits. Um, so anyway, putting it, this bill is less popular than Thatcher's uh, poll tax. I mean, that's just a fact. And yet, he had the escape route. He had the chance to get away and go, honest girl, it wasn't me. It was those bad people at Westminster. And instead... He takes us through. Um, what an idiot. Once again, Roddy, this was an opportunity to, as you said, to reset, to allow him to say, I am the First Minister. From now on, I will govern in the manner in which I believe. Unfortunately, what, we, what we've had over the past 96 hours is a continued insane loyalty to the previous First Minister and her drive mm -hmm for this particular piece of legislation. I mean, for me, there were, there were three things. The first one being here was the great opportunity to say, the people have spoken, we will move on. Secondly, for him to be honest about the actual judgment. The whole of that debate, which, you know, re remember, and this is very, very important because it shows outright cowardice, neither the First Minister, nor the previous First Minister, nor the Deputy First Minister were in attendance for this particular admission of uh, defeat. And all I got from it was that they failed to understand, and they still fail to understand, that the reason Section 35 was used because it was going to impact on the UK-wide Equality Act. Now, that will not change with a change of person in number 10 Downing Street, unless what they're suggesting is that Starmer puts something in his manifesto for the election next year, which is about making changes to the Equality Act. And that is simply not going to happen. This is, this is absolutely childish. This is like, used to happen at primary school. Someone would do something, they would get caught, and then they would spend the next 50 minutes saying, no, they didn't do it, and then eventually admit, yes, they did. Now, they had the opportunity to cut that 50 minutes down to five seconds just the other day. But it shows you, I think, just how captured by his lack of imagination, his lack of vision, and his lack of intellect the current First Minister is. To not even attend and support your own ministers who are attempting to defend what so you know is deeply, deeply unpopular with the people, but to choose not to be there. It's, it, 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 it beggars belief, it absolutely beggars belief. I do not believe, having done a bit of research, that any, uh, any First Minister in, at any point since 1999 has absented themselves when they've had to come to the chamber and admit they were wrong. It's never mm. happened before. And happening on the SNP's watch, frankly, as a member of the party, it disgusts me. Another thing, it was clear in what Shirley Ann Somerville said, and particularly in responses to questions from backbenchers, that they are going to continue to fund as if they hadn't lost the case. 
So the guidance in schools, the guidance for police, the guidance for National Health Service, and of course, providing the money to their client organizations who have pushed for the GRRB, they are all going to be continue, their funding will continue and the support will be there. Now, in the current crisis with a 17% or possibly 20% cut in the block grant to the Scottish government, for them to pretend that a piece of legislation that does not exist other than on a piece of paper has no royal assent, they will carry on with the guidance, they will carry on with the providing of funding as if this piece of legislation had passed. I mean, this is, it is beyond understanding. And again, right back to what I said at the beginning, this was the opportunity in this time of austerity, in this time of, of cuts to the third sector, in times of major cuts to local councils, here was an opportunity to say, we have thrown money away. We will not throw good money after bad in the coming budget. These budgets will be trimmed so that we can put them into places like housing. The fact that we have, the fact on the, you know, within the same week as saying you'll continue to fund as if a piece of legislation had been passed that hasn't been passed, and we know that they've cut the housing budget. It's, it, it, it beggars belief, Roddy, it really beggars belief. But this is the third opportunity the First Minister has had to say, I am not Nicola Sturgeon's puppet. And he has not done it. And it's pathetic. Yeah, he is the puppet. You know, they were complaining that the Tories stopped for them, but they're quite happy to get Labour to try and bail them out with this. The hypocrisy is just quite ridiculous. Um, <coughs> as we've alluded to, um, Eva, this was also Scottish Budget Week. And as Lloyd has pointed out, the budget since 2012 has been reduced by 17%. And by 2026, they're saying it's going to be down by 20%. And of course, the usual um, house jobs and house job parties saying, oh, I see, you can't run your economy. Look how terrible it is. Down in Wales, we've got the Labour Party saying it's the Tories in Westminster. Up here in Scotland, of course, the Labour Party's not. They're blaming the SNP. They won't blame London. I'm not blaming London, actually. I'm blaming the SNP and the Greens. Um, in 2021, when I stood as a candidate for ALBA in the Holyrood Parliament elections, it was made plain that we could have had a supermajority had that happened and we'd had, in effect, a coalition of SNP and ALBA. Scotland would be independent by now. We'd be setting our own budget. We wouldn't have had a reverse wind auction where we were selling our wind energy off for substantially less than it was worth. We'd be talking in serious terms about having a competent government that prioritised the needs of the people of this country. We wouldn't be going to Westminster begging to get some of our own money back. So yes, for the time being, the cuts are laid at the door of Westminster, but that's only part of the problem. The whole area has to be contextualised. And the context is that there have been numerous mandates for independence since 2015 and not one of them has been implemented. Instead, we had the folly or the application to the Supreme Court. So Westminster just now, with the current SNP leadership, can laugh at them. They can, Westminster can cut the Scottish budget as often and as deeply as they want because as far as Westminster is concerned, the Scots are too stupid to fight back. And, mm -hmm. you know, what, what really amplifies my case is that this week Keith Brown announced that the YES website has been revamped and it includes a lot more information for SNP members and activists on the case for independence and how to promote the case for independence. So naturally, I had a good look through the website and I was interested particularly to establish the route map offered by YES Scotland and the SNP to independence. And guess what it is? Elect an SNP MP at a general election to then enable the SNP to fight for the democratic case for Scottish independence. It's not UDI. It's not elect a majority of SNP or independence supporting MPs. It's not get the popular vote and then we'll declare independence and we'll negotiate the terms of the settlement. It's vote SNP Give us another mandate. Well, mandate after mandate after mandate is not going to solve the problems with the Scottish budget. So as Lloyd said, there's a major issue relative to housing. We've got all our major cities declaring a housing emergency 
A housing emergency means that 10,000 people are homeless. Thousands of those are children. And homeless doesn't necessarily mean not having a roof over your head, although it does mean that for some people. But what it often means is that you're living in a bed and breakfast where you have to leave early in the morning, you're not allowed back in until tea time. That's not allowed for anybody. It means that some people are rough sleeping and they're being fed from a soup kitchen, especially in Glasgow. It means that you have no security at all. A lot of these homeless places that folk have to live in are really not nice in the slightest. They're not well furnished, they're not well equipped. Often there are issues about heating and damp and substandard um, accommodation is provided. And it costs a fortune. Nowadays, that ought not to be happening. We should have a national corporation and a national energy company. And we shouldn't be in the position where a deputy first minister, who's also the minister for the economy or whatever it is, is standing in Hollywood reading a speech that somebody wrote for her with a lot of big numbers in it that she doesn't understand. And there lies the rub. The current government is not a competent one. They don't know what they're doing when it comes to setting a budget. All they do is listen to what the advisors tell them about where they might be able to make the cuts and get away with it. And instead of thinking about where to cut, and, and this will people in the public sector had because we know there are likely to be job losses across the local authorities because of the financial problems they're facing, that affects people on the ground. It affects home carers, it affects teachers, it affects nursery places, it affects your bin men, it affects all the stuff that counsellors hear about at their surgeries week in and week out. The daily grind of normal life will be very badly affected by the content of this particular budget. And we didn't have to be living like this if we leaders who were prepared to lay it on the line to Westminster and say Scotland will pass, the Scottish Parliament will pass, Ash Reagan's bill and ask the people in a referendum if they want to have the chance to choose their own style of government. We should also see the SNP supporting Neil Hanvey's bill to bring the power for an independence referendum back to Scotland. And we should certainly see every single independent support and leader of every party and every civic organisation clamouring, battering down the doors of Butte House, battering down the doors of Holyrood to get the point across that we need to have a constitutional convention without mm -hmm. delay. We shouldn't be worrying about the Scottish budget. <coughs> it's overflowing with the wealth that comes out of the North Sea and out of our whisky and our forestry and our tourism and numerous other industries. We have money to burn in this country if it was our money mm -hmm. to burn and spend. Correct. Um, Techie, can you stick up Douglas Ross and Wee Sunak? There you go. Um, you know, this is typical of them, uh, Yvonne. You know, they vote to cut the local government funding when they're at Westminster, and then when it happens, they say, oh, what are you going to do about it? Um, and as we've said, they're going, what are they going to do about it? They're going to keep funding things regarding the GRRB and some of the things that have hi been highlighted by Eva could do better with that money than this bloody GRRB. Something is going to snap. I can feel it because the poverty is increasing. Um, Eva was talking about uh, people in uh, hotels, and I use the term loosely, hotels. Um, I've got uh, one girl that I know who's uh, in a room in a guest house with her two children. She's not allowed to cook. One of her kids is uh, relying on milk and uh, just practical things like that. The, the grinding poverty that's out there, and it's not that difficult to find. And yet you've got this SNP-led government that is just wasting money and the greens as well they don't know how quick they can burn it, it, it it's really demoralizing and people will snap it's coming i can feel it coming that 
And and these politicians have absolutely no filter at all. The fat cats in Westminster have just given themselves a seven or eight percent pay rise, which means that they're <coughs> not a hundred grand a year now. And ordinary voters are going to there will be a backlash because there's only so much that people will put up with. People are going to die this winter because they'll freeze to death. They won't be able to pay their heating bills. Some of them won't be able to, um, you know, the, the heat or heat lot are, are just going to be in an impossible position. And the homelessness is more in your face now than it's ever been before. It, it really, we are like a, a third world country. And there was great joy the other day because I think the economy had gone up 0.1%, which meant a reverse of... Uh, um, the bad times. And then we find out that those figures have been exaggerated. And we're actually one month off going into an official recession. Mm. And I just do not know how people are going to manage. It's uh, these are desperate, desperate times. And uh, in the in the bigger cities, you can't move um, for homeless people. We're not civilized at all. And then you've got these numpties in Holyrood that are putting the GRR tucked away on a back shelf to try and sneak back out again when nobody's looking. And I'll tell you why Humza Yusuf wasn't in Holyrood to um, to be seen anywhere near it. I think it's because the people in his local mosque have probably told him, "Get rid of this. It's it's against our beliefs." You know, much in the same way as it's against Christian beliefs and Jewish beliefs as well. So. That, that's, you know, Humza has got the backbone of an amoeba. Hmm. And that yeah. is the sort of person who makes the leader. And, of course, Keir Starmer has gone army barmy. He thinks that a camouflage jacket is going to attract voters and make him look like a tough guy. And it doesn't. It makes him look weak and pathetic. And I just okay. despair, you know, where are the quality politicians, the leaders, the people who, you know, you want to follow? Um, in Aleppo, you know, we've got Alex Salmond, and he is a statesman. And he, he must be looking at, at, at some of the so-called leaders now and thinking, how the hell did they get into that position? It's... Well, that's a good question. I don't know how some of them get in, actually. But the one thing I want to say, Lloyd, um, and congrats, you don't want to embarrass Eva here and Alan Petrie, but the one great thing to come out of the um, the budget was the fact that the, the policy that Eva's equalities group championed about wiping out the school dinners debt um, it was incorporated by the, the Scottish government into the budget. Um, fabulous news. Absolutely. And this, I mean, absolutely congratulations to, to Eva and to Leanne and to Alan and to everybody who took part in the, in the roadshows as well. But this shows you the power of pressure, the power of pressure in politics. When you come up with an idea that is, that, you know, is a no-brainer, what's more is morally correct. Mm -hmm. That's the most important part of it, is then uh, governments have to take these things on board. 
I mean, even even Thatcher took on board certain things where she was boxed into the corner and then and and had to come out. And I genuinely believe I think this would have been overlooked by the SNP government if it hadn't been from the outside pressure that was created by the policy of the Alpa Party. That's you know it should have been SNP policy is the truth of the matter, but it wasn't. Uh, but I'm glad that they decided to do it. But the real thing about budget processing, I've seen a few budgets over the years myself. It's the time when you find out what the genuine priorities and the and the moral red lines are for any government. It's it's how you you show to the people what the priorities are. Now, in our circumstances, where as Eva referred to, we have three of our major cities have declared a housing crisis. It's absolutely clear that we have a major problem with the ambulance service at the moment. We have major issues with uh, GP surgeries, we have major issues with uh, the ability of people to get NHS dentists. Uh, we have deeply worrying concerns about uh, the, the, the funding, but more importantly, the, the actual number of members of the police force that there are. Uh, huge transport problems and, and overall a, a huge amount of in-work poverty. But the SNP government will continue to fund on the basis of their, their equalities policy or, or their, their vision of equalities. They will continue to fund the organisations who were the primary champions of the GRRB. They will continue without any cuts to their budget. That was stated very clearly in the Parliament the other day, despite the fact that these organisations are primarily uh, functional. <coughs> they, 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 serve, they, they, they serve little frontline purpose. What they are are their little bureaucracies that have supported the ideological line taken by the previous First Minister. Now, there is no requirement given that the bill has been shelved and no longer is not and is not law and has not been enacted. There is no moral reason why that money could not have been reallocated within the equalities budget to those who are homeless, to those who are rough sleeping. You know, the huge number of people we have in Scotland rough sleeping at the moment. That could have been used in a number of other areas which would directly affect today. The, 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 the quality of life of, of, of the people in our country who are given the least quality of life, not just by our Scottish government, but by the nature of the British state. These were the opportunities. And what we have here is the SNP has effectively told us that they will never admit they are wrong, that they will only provide for those who are their supportive loyally supportive groups within the third sector and frankly the working people and the working poor of this country can go hang as far as they're concerned it, it, it genuinely it, it's hurtful it's 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 hurtful to see people stand up in the chamber who clearly do not have the necessary ability nor indeed the necessary central political vision that what government is about if it's about anything, it's about protecting the lives of the people who are the most disadvantaged in your society. That is the first goal of any truly moral government. And what we had this week was a clear statement that these people don't count to the current SNP front bench, nor indeed the Greens and the others who will vote for this particular budget. I mean, it, 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 it's astonishing to me that uh, the Greens under Robin Harper were the cuddly, cosy, lentil-munching, sandal-wearing ecologists. The current Green Party seems to have turned into the Liberal Democrat Party of 1999, where they shuffled into government with a Labour Party and immediately abandoned their commitment to free education. And I'm talking about Scotland. I'm not talking about the abandonment of free education that they did at Westminster. In the first term of the Parliament, we reintroduced fees for students, which had not existed in Scotland prior to the Scottish Parliament. They were introduced here because the Liberal Democrats, for the sake of an extra 30 grand and, a, and getting shuffled about in a ministerial mondeo, 
They let all their principles fall. And what is clear now is this Green Party or this Green Party leadership has abandoned all of their ecological principles for the sake of driving forward the agenda of 0.04% of the population. It's disgusting. Absolutely. Absolutely. Keke, um, get ready for this. Put up that um, uh, thing from because we're talking about the budget being reduced by 17%, Eva. But I was so good to hear that our MPs are going to get a nice 7.1 pay rise. I mean, you don't want them going without, do we? It's nice at Christmas that they can get a pay rise, isn't it? Stick it up, take it. Warm the cockles of my heart. Oh, yeah. I, I am pretty depressed, actually, to see what they would award themselves. The fact that they've awarded themselves anything at all is sheer hypocrisy. When you look at the austerity programme that's been visited on us for the past few years, and it's all the more reason for Scotland to get the hell out of Westminster. Yep. Um, when, I, I was reminded there when Lloyd was talking about all the areas of, of life in Scotland where there are serious issues. And I'm thinking particularly about people who are vulnerable and who need public services of different sorts. And at the moment in Scotland, there is, as I've said before a couple of weeks ago, a major shortage of foster placements. Um, children from Clamanshire who need to go into foster care might well be placed a distance of some three hours drive away from home, which would necessitate, obviously, not just losing contact with their family and friends and their schoolmates that have to change school. Any arrangements for them to have family contact will be very difficult to make. And, you know, that money, £6,000 pay rise, that's only the rise per MP, mm. that would pay for an awful lot of the facilities that children in care or threatened with going into care actually need or that some of the support that their families need, which would enable them to stay safely at home. The other areas where people are vulnerable and Scotland needs more investment is in relation to law and order. Because in the Scottish budget this week, there was an awful lot of money made available for the Crown Office and Procurator Fiscal Service. And there was some money for the police, but not nowhere near enough, quite frankly. But there was little extra money for the legal aid budget, particularly for criminal legal aid as well as my field, civil legal aid. So it's become the case in Scotland now that criminal defence lawyers who work on legal aid are becoming rarer than hen's teeth. But the the um, profession is ageing. There will come a day when my generation retire and there's nobody left to come behind us. When I started, the young folk did the court work, the older guys, the older men and women did the office work, the chamber work. Now you go to court and you're lucky if you see somebody under the age of 45 doing criminal work and in the main, in my line in civil work, we're very few and far between. There are two civil legal aid practitioners in Clipmanninshire now. There was nothing in the budget this week to help the people that need our services. So if you're skint, you're in Clipmanninshire, you're on universal credit, you've got two lawyers to choose from, that's your lot. Um, but if you've got money, there's a good dozen or so that you can choose from. And that position is replicated nationwide. Um, there are innumerable, innumerable areas where we need money targeted at what should be the priorities of the Scottish government. That ain't going to happen with this government. And it's certainly not going to happen through to Westminster, where the priority is lining their own individual pockets as MPs. Because 90-odd yep. grand as a salary is a hell of an amount of money for anybody but when you bear in mind that they're there part time and they have an enormous expenses budget over and above a salary, they don't need mm. to dip into their salary in the main very much, if at all, for accommodation or travel or food, food. or heating. So that money that's their wage can almost all be banked because very little of it is actually needed for living expenses. It's an absolute yeah. disgrace. But, you know, it, again, it should be a compulsory. It should be an encouragement to the people of Scotland to say, stuff this, we're out of here. Absolutely. Here, here. Uh, I mean, here's the fact, you know, Yvonne, you know, unlike junior doctors or railway men, the MPs never need to go on strike to get an inflation busted pay rise, do they? There you go. I'm going to say it. You'll make a quid. Sorry? You owe me another quid. 
Am I on mute? You will. Yeah. Oh, right. Well, the, I forgot what I was going to say now. This. <laughs> Okay, what well, I'm um, saying about the fact that they don't have to go in straight to get a pay rise or MPs. Uh, and, you know, you have to wonder what, what role they actually perform for the public because um, doctors save lives, the r rail workers get us uh, to and from work and, and uh, on our holidays and... Um, what purpose do MPs serve, apart from maybe a form of entertainment and not that hugely entertaining either? Very, very few of them are actually doing any good whatsoever. I mean, there are exceptions, but um, they don't work the, the late and social hours that they used to do. Um, there are an extremely privileged class that seem to have a, a blindness and a deafness when it comes to people who are going to them about problems that Eva's just listed, you know, the poverty. And when you think about the wealth that Scotland has as a nation, and I... I <laughs> trying to get a dental appointment for one of my boys who needed an emergency surgery today. It's been a nightmare. Where are the dentists, the lawyers? You know, these, these are professions that, um, that maybe we've taken for granted in the past, but we can't now. There's no justice. There's no... For, for people who are born into poverty, there is no justice at all. And we're running a two-class system, those that have and those that don't. And yet here we are in a country that is rich in natural resources. You just have to go to London to see all the fine buildings there built by our money, our oil, all these Canary Wharf and, and places like that. And I just wonder how much more humiliation we're going to take. I think you're, you're on, on mute what? now, Ros. I will quit. I don't know, but, um, that's because I'm coughing all the time, but I was noticed uh, an article today that um, they're taking money out of the HS2 budget to fix the potholes in London. Not in Birmingham, not in Manchester, not in Edinburgh, not in Glasgow, but again in London. And who's going to pay that? Well, we're going to pay one-eighth of it for sure, Lloyd. Um, and these guys who are now on 92 grand, they're also, I don't know what percentage, maybe you know, how many also have other jobs at 10 grand a day, you know, 20. 12 hours a, a year they, they work and they get big, huge money. Um, it's just obscene. I, th I think the last figure that, that I saw, I mean, it's this is not absolutely, definitely the figure, but the last one I remember was you were talking about, I think it was between 38 and 42% of the members of the House of Commons uh, have outside interests uh, mm -hmm. and outside payments. And that goes up to about 75% when you include the House of Lords, remembering that they do have a, a, a function. But getting back to the, the pay rise, you know, here's another bit of jiggery pokery, beautifully done by the Labour Party. It was the Labour Party under Blair who, who changed the rules on who decides on MP salaries and their increases. It was always done, you'll remember, in the chamber uh, it was a committee of the, of the parliament itself that would make a proposal. It was then debated and voted on, and they always obviously voted for what the, 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 for mere money. But it caused so much grief, and Mandelson and uh, Alistair Campbell went to Blair and said, look, we've got to sort this out. We're going to get bad headlines day in, day out. Every year when this comes up, we're going to have to be dealing with it, because it used to happen on, a, on an annual basis. It wasn't... A, 
per uh, parliamentary term basis. So what they did is they created this so-called outside body uh, with a mechanism to it that the um, it, 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 it's it's related to inflation in some way or another, but it's always a number of points above it. But now they can say as well, it's not our fault, Gov. Big boy did it and ran away mm. because it is an, an independent outside organisation, which they can't reject it. They can individually reject it, as Alex Salmon did when he was in the Westminster Parliament and they got the increase and he gave it to charity along with all the other SNP members at the time. I'm sure that pissed Pete Witcher off no end. But uh, that aside, the, I think everybody maybe forgets here as well, and this is why there'll be no screaming from the benches in Holyrood or indeed from the Senate in Cardiff, that the increase in the salary of MSPs and MAs and, and MLAs in Northern Ireland is directly linked to the increase that you get at Westminster. Mm. It's all been tied. It's been, it, and, and so everybody can throw their hands up and say, it wasn't us. Somebody else did it. Now, the, 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 fact, the fact is, they're paid too much anyway. I mean, especially when you, you look at it coldly from the point of view of everybody else that goes to work has to pay for eating, has to pay for travelling to their work. Mm. Has, has, has to, many people, they have to actually pay for the equipment that they use at their work. You know, people people don't get the expense accounts. And the expense accounts, they'll always tell you, is, is, oh, it's all about paying staff. It's not. When you actually go and look at some of the breakdowns, it, now, fair enough for the guys from the Shetlands, the Orkness, and good old Angus Brendan in the Western Isles, their travel costs a lot for very simple reasons. Britain doesn't recognise that it's got a... Well, it thinks it's got a periphery. It doesn't recognise that periphery is actually part of its own country. So transport is more expensive than it should be in reality. But the, the, this, 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 this whole affair just it, it brings again clearly to view how the political class <coughs> right across the United Kingdom of Great Britain and Northern Ireland look after themselves and what we're desperately needing most especially in Scotland, is a shake-up of exactly who it is that the parties allow to go forward. Members of parties need to waken up and genuinely interrogate potential candidates and current candidates about what their, their basic poli politics are and what their moral values are. And if they did that, I think some of them might be surprised at how vacuous they find out that the answers that they get back are. I agree with you 100%. Um, moving on, one of the things is we are in a, a terrible economic state, um, Eva. But one of the things they said through Brexit was that they were going to have a deal with America within hours of uh, Brexit being ratified. In fact, this week, Biden turned around and said, nah, you know, he's not going to sign a, a trade agreement with the UK. Is this, uh, is this the, the special relationship they keep talking about? Is that what they tell you to pass up? Is that, that what that's about? Yeah, that's the special relationship that says get stuff. We've got other pals worldwide and we don't need you because actually you Brits are a pretty insignificant pimple on the surface of the end these days. Um, we're only useful in the context of war and particularly Trident on the Clyde. Um, that's the only reason that we have any significance for the Americans now. And simple fact of the matter is that they're they're too big and too important and too many fish to fry in other places to be bothering to waste their time with us. Um, it's actually quite embarrassing. Um, but there you have it. Yeah. Um, another thing this week coming out of the USA, Yvonne, was uh, Anthony Blinken, the Secretary of State, um, who said, assured American voters that 90% um, of all the money pledged to Ukraine, they shouldn't worry about it because it remains in America and creates jobs in the military industrial complex and, you know, gets tax and the drip, the famous drip, drip down, uh, you know, is in action. So, you know, where's the incentive for them? They're, they're boosting that it boosts their economy. Well, where's the chances of them stopping the killing? You're, you're muted. You're muted.
Still muted. There you go. The Ukrainians are about to learn a very hard lesson, and that is friendship with America is not worth a light. Mm. The Shia in Iraq who were told to rise up against Saddam um, and did, thinking that America would go and help them, were left high and dry. Mm -hmm. um, the Kurdish community, in fact, I often wonder why the Kurds put so much trust in America, because they are continually shafted in Syria, in Iraq, um, and, and uh, of course, now the Ukrainians have um, been used so that America can fight a proxy war with Russia. And of course, it's no longer convenient for America because it's tied up in, in meddling in so many other mm -hmm. different areas. It's destabilized Pakistan um, and, and uh, affected a military coup there against Imran Khan. It's uh, playing this, uh, this disgraceful game with the UN over Gaza. It is meddling everywhere and it doesn't have time for um, Ukraine. And in some ways, I feel sorry for Zelensky, who, of course, was the darling of the uh, military industrial complex when he stamped around in his camouflage gear and saying, I want F-16 fighters and I want this and I want that. And he gave them a shopping list and he spoke in Congress and everybody applauded him. And wherever he went around the world, now he couldn't even get a crowd at the opening of an envelope. And that, that is because America has dropped Ukraine. And it's it's quite uh, Putin must be rubbing his hands with glee. And yep. uh, in fact, Putin is now turning around saying, I'm quite happy to sit down and negotiate over Ukraine, but we are not giving any land back. Yep. So, you know, having the Americans as friends is more of a liability oh, than sure. everything else. And if, 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 if this trade deal means that we're not going to be eating chloroform-filled poultry, <laughs> then I'm quite happy. So, um, yeah, I mean, we have got to look, when I say we, the UK has got to learn to operate without this toxic special friendship, which is dragging everybody down. And of course, the thing is, it all goes back to independence. If we had bloody independence, we wouldn't be bothering. We would just be mere spectators. And it affects us as well. So, again, we have to get independence. I agree. Um, I absolutely agree. Um, Lloyd, it was Henry Kissinger who said to be an enemy of America is very dangerous to be a friend is fatal <laughs> so he said something truthful during his hundred years yep. then <laughs> well there was one that we didn't mention was vietnam and afghanistan they've done yeah. that there as well georgia other places no I, I, i'd just like to pick up something vaughn said and, it, and, and it, it, you know no we shouldn't be surprised by this yes it's happened loads of times before yes it will happen in the future but the essential thing here is why is it that a, a piddly wee island off the coast of Europe, well, mainly its southern part, has got this bizarre concept that it has influence in the world. Now, there is, it does have influence so long as it is a member of the Security Council of the Permanent Five, right? That can't be denied. But when you cannot put an aircraft carrier to sea into a potential war zone with the necessary support ships because your entire navy your entire navy 
would not make a single carrier battle group standard as they are across the world no. because we don't have the people we don't have the money we don't have the abilities anymore i mean the uk i keep saying we it's like you when you're talking about the snb roddy i make this mistake all the time just because i've got one of those daft passports but the the absurdity of it is and somebody needs to stand up and say this to the good people of the rest of the united kingdom why is it that for the sake of giving yourselves the pretense that you've got some importance <clears throat> in the world you will allow a huge amount of the the, of the wealth of the country to be spent as a, effectively on a, a military, a navy, and an air force that is merely an adjunct of the United States. Why mm. would you do that when there are people sleeping on the streets? There are people desperate for homes. There are people, our, our pension level, the pension level in the United Kingdom is the second worst in the Northern Hemisphere, for God's yeah. sake. But we're a rich, powerful country that spends a huge amount of money in maintaining its, its illegal nuclear deterrent. And it's the illegal nuclear deterrent that allows it to retain its place in the Security Council of the United Nations, where all it does is poodle for the Americans. Absolutely. It's, it, the amount of waste, it's in the multi-billions, year on year, money that could be used not for building HS2, not for building the Jubilee bloody line, could be used for addressing the central and major issues of poverty and inequality in England, Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland, instead of this pretense of post-imperial power, where you stoat about the world where your main buddy laughs up their sleeve at the fact that they, they know that within the next five to six years, the two so-called super aircraft carriers will effectively be part of the United States Navy because you cannot sail them without their support Correct. or they're just big, big targets. The Houthis could take them out. That's the fact of the matter. This, this post-imperial nightmare that we're living in, what I don't understand is that it, somehow the education system in large parts of the, of the so-called United Kingdom has convinced people that they benefit from having had a history of massacring people across the world, stealing all their stuff, and then now when you're a nothing, you can be the best pal of the, the new kid on the block who's carrying out exactly <laughs> the same plan as the UK carried out during the 18th and the 19th century. When are people going to wake up? You can't kind of keep complaining about the National Health Service and say there's no money, there's no money, when the money's getting spent on absolutely useless white elephants that can't even carry aircraft that right. were made in this country. Sorry, that was a bit of a rant there. No, it's a good rant. But, I mean, it was Blair himself that said, you know, uh, the, the, the Trident was just a vanity project. It had actually no um, defence use. And the yeah. other thing, they're always going on about um, the ferries. That's uh, The unionist, the house jobs, love to go, oh, you can't build a ferry. The Type 45s only operate in, in cold water. When they get to places like the Persian Gulf, they break down and they could run out of power. And if that happens, the Hutus will just take them out. So um, it's amazing that uh, this fleet they're going to join would send in a couple of the Type 45s, which could break down. It's embarrassing. Um, the clock's kicking on. A couple of things I want to get in. Eva, um, this week, some really good news in Switzerland. Switzerland have decided to legalise cocaine use. Um, and uh, they've decided that the war on drugs has been lost and they're as well regulating it. Um, and I'm now questioning why Craig Murray's in Switzerland. I wonder if he got word on this and he knew before this happened. Only <laughs> kidding, Craig. Um, but um, I, I, I'm a believer that, um, you know, that we should legalise all drugs. I don't believe that prohibition works. The prohibition in America for alcohol showed it doesn't work. All it does is make the, the gangsters rich. Um, I don't know where you are in this, but I think that legalising drugs is, is the way forward. I think that it's a very small part of a much bigger, very complex, complicated picture. And to talk in isolation about decriminalisation of drugs is not helpful because what you have to do is look at the health approach 
in respect of problems caused by drugs, including addiction, that people are unable to break and which damages and ruins and ends unnecessarily and prematurely so many lives, particularly in Scotland, which, as we know, remains the drugs deaths capital of Europe. And interestingly, if you Google why are drugs such a problem in Scotland, you find a one-word answer, and again, yet again, it's poverty. Mm -hmm. 16 times more likely to die from a drug death in the poorer areas of Scotland than you are in the wealthier areas. That statistic speaks for itself. And the ongoing issue in Scotland is a debate um, between the merits of harm reduction and recovery. And the problem with decriminalising drugs is that sometimes that means that people look at harm reduction and they remain addicted. And sometimes the aim of complete recovery from addiction gets forgotten. And that's a controversial area of government policy in Scotland now because the vast bulk of funding for drug treatments goes into harm reduction, including the provision of naloxone and various different services, including talking therapies, and comparatively small amounts are used for rehabilitation. And there's also an argument about the meaning of the word rehabilitation. We'd be better to talk about harm reduction and recovery because the, both of these um, outcomes have a place in a much wider debate. But decriminalisation, as I said at the start, a small part of this. What needs to happen is dialogue between the agencies with lived and living experience. You know, the, the former addicts who are now the drugs workers, they need to have an, a, an in to the Scottish government, to the policy makers, to the drugs minister, who ought not to listen only to one sector, to one sector of those working within the drugs misuse field. The statistics in 2022 for drugs deaths, I think it was 1,051 people died in Scotland that year, which was 279 fewer people than the previous year. Unfortunately, the numbers are up this year, and that's just a sad fact of life. What's dreadful um, from the particular perspective of cocaine is that several years ago, cocaine featured in a very small percentage of deaths in Scotland. It now features in between a third and a quarter of the deaths of drug addicts in Scot or drug users in Scotland because most Scottish deaths arise from people who have poly drug use. They're not using one drug, they're using a combination. And for a lot of people, it's cocaine plus something like street valium and that leads to a horrible and early death so we talk about heroin a lot um, because that's the obvious you know a very strong very difficult drug and uh, the addiction to which is is most horrible to try to defeat but cocaine has ruined many lives many relationships i have you know a work experience um of families broken by drug use as and, and ongoing drug use not not simply those tragedies where somebody has died either through drug use or at their own hand because they've been addicted. So whilst decriminalisation might be welcome in some instances, there's a health issue that needs to be considered very closely and carefully because it's so complex. A particular matter to look out for is Anthony Ward and Favour UK and their Right to Recovery Bill because that bill and the Alba Party policy which Leanne Tervet and I helped to write, has to do with enabling people to choose the type of treatment and the type of rehabilitation and the type of management that best suits their personalities as individuals or their domestic or societal circumstances, yeah. rather than making this a one-size-fits-all. Yeah, but also I think, um, is it not also the case that um, the cutting of the the, the cocaine and the heroin causes problems, and that's why maybe legalising it, you would get purer. I mean, I don't know, I'm not a great expert, but that might help a bit. Um, on, uh, uh, We're running out of time. There's a couple of things I want to get in, and as we're coming towards the end, the end of the year, and then last show before it all kicks off, all the madness tomorrow, um, I just wanted to pop, take it. Could you put up the Daily Mail's little rant? I, like, I do like a Daily Mail rant. 
here we go. Now, what, what did they think was going to happen when Brexit was put in place? There you go. Um, because uh, the EU are putting in these uh, tests, te you know, you've got to do these things. You know, don't they know we're English? Sort of attitude coming from the old Daily Mail. Quite pathetic, isn't it? Go on, Yvonne. Well, these facial, it's about CCTV, isn't it? And facial recognition. Yeah, and how dare they do that because we're English? You know what I mean? Sort well, of attitude by the Daily Mail. One of, one of the most surveilled cities in the world is, uh, is Glasgow. And Glasgow is using facial recognition that is so advanced. It gets it from Israel. How the hell the council ever put it through is um, is beyond me. But um, it's where is it going to end? And all this pompous invective from the Daily Mail, yes, it's quite entertaining to see them get in a lather about it. But I'd like to bet that uh, people in Glasgow have no idea that they're part of this giant experiment. And uh, the CCTV in um, in the city is being used, I think, for sinister purposes. And uh, people don't seem to be aware of it. I tried mentioning it to a city well, councillor recently. Well, yes. Um, and and uh, people should be asking their councillors, did you pass this? Why did you pass it? What was the deal? How much does it cost? Are you treating us as lab rats? You know, it's uh, the the there was big headlines again in the mail a few months ago when um, it turned out that they've got CCTV in Kabul. They've got, I think, it's sixty thousand cameras, which is a tiny amount compared to what's in Britain, but as I say, the most sinister of uh, of all of these uh, uh, networks is in Glasgow. Mm. Right, could I just finish up here with this? And I'm hoping Techie will got it. I'm asking, I'm not quite sure. That Richard Madley this week, an absolute belter on his show. Up onto um, warlords coming out of Yemen. That's the one. Up Stick. onto warlords coming out of Yemen into the Red Sea on board small boats and on drones, and they're landing on, on tankers and terrorizing the crew. Um, and I just find it extraordinary that we could win the Battle of the Atlantic mm. against German U boats and torpedoes, <laughs> but we can't seem to protect our shipping going up the Red Sea. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the word that springs to mind immediately, Lloyd, is Fanny. I mean, the Battle of the Atlantic and U boats. Um, he's a mad <laughs> howler. He's a, he's, I, I, I mean, he's definitely he's preparing for his retirement. The crazier and crazier he gets, he knows he's going to get dumped off the telly at some point because it oh. happens to everybody. So this is him bidding for Nick Ferrari's job or who's that idiot, Mike Graham. Uh, you know, he's, 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 he's wandering into shock jock territory. Uh, not in the least surprised, you know. Uh, <laughs> Richard Maidley. He has a boot club, apparently. I wonder if Nicola's part of that, too. But oh. getting back, if I just for a second, Roddy, the irony of the Daily Mail complaining about people getting ID'd, fingerprinted, and facial recognition, while tomorrow's headline will probably be another criminal has come in from Europe, a criminal immigrant. Why don't we have stricter controls over people coming in and we should fingerprint them and we should check for their criminal background? Yeah. Hey, come on, waking up, you people. You don't mm -hmm. rule the world no more. Yeah, because it's, it is the old don't you know we're English type attitude. Oh, and, yeah. um, we are at the end of our time here, folks, and it is um, the end of the show. Now, listen, folks, thanks for being with us all year. We really appreciate it. We've not had a wee break at all. You know, we worked right through the summer. So we're going to take a week, 10 days maybe off before we get into the new year and everything comes back, unless, of course, something happens, anything um, exciting happens, we will be here for you. Um, but tomorrow, may Santa bring you all you want. 
Uh, may you have a great time. May you stay healthy and uh, we'll see you all again very, very soon. Merry Christmas. Through a Scottish Prism, the programme that is unapologetically pro-Scottish independence and anti-Westminster rule. Everything we say here is viewed through a Scottish Prism. Brought to you by Barhead Boy.